show your best work. And especially if it's something where you want to apply to do like journals, tableware, whatever, and all you have is patterns, like you are asking someone to make a pretty big leap mm. to know that you can know. design it's not a just really patterns. good dinner plate that has, you know, this crazy, cool, interesting, you know, composition happening. It's just, you're limiting yourself, I think. I I am so excited to be here today with Jill Lebenick. Jill is an illustrator who spent years working as both a staff designer and an art director, and she has recently transitioned into working for herself. She's a freelancer who also licenses her art, and her sweet, whimsical style has been on products for clients like Sur La Tab, Studio O, and Figo Fabrics. I really admire Jill's practical understanding of this industry, and I know her experiences and advice as an art director is something that we can all benefit from. So welcome, Jill. Hi, <laughs> glad so to be here. To yeah. So to start, can you just give us a sort of brief overview so we get the lay of the land of your design background and, you know, where you are now? Yeah, so... Um... I went the traditional art school route. Um, I studied illustration and it was kind of on a whim that I even chose that path. I didn't really, didn't really know what I wanted to do, to be honest. Um, and at the time, at least, illustration programs were very traditional. Um, there wasn't a lot of focus on what we do now, which is like falls into the like surface design niche. Um, it was much more traditional painting, drawing, figure drawing, life studies, that kind of thing. And I struggled a lot because I was like, I don't, I don't like this. I don't love this. Like, did I, I picked the wrong career. What am I going to do with myself? Um, and so after I graduated, I took the first job I could get when I moved out to Seattle and it was a really small design company. I was, the designer quit on my first day. <laughs> the other designer, <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. I was fresh out of school. I was an illustrator and this was a design job. Um, and so I basically, luckily they hired more designers, um, spent that first almost two years of my career just learning how to be a designer because it was such a different skill set mm -hmm. than illustration. And the two really, they go hand in hand and, and pair really nicely and have been such a great pairing across my career. But that's that's where I started and then just um, kept working in the sort of gift industry surface design space for the next 15 years. <laughs> So basically like art for product sort art of idea. Product. Yep. Art for product. Um, a lot of books, stationary, social stationary, gift, um, anything sort of in that space, really. Awesome. And so, I mean, you've had a lot of different, you know, jobs, but, and I'm sure there's a lot to dive into, but I know that the thing that people are very interested in, especially my audience is the life of an art director. And I know that you've had some of that experience in your career. Um, when you were working as an art director, did you work with independent artists like we are now? Or were all your projects designed in-house and you were, you know, on, you know, directing your in-house designers? Or how how was your art director work set up? Uh, both. Um, so I have worked plenty with outside artists um, where I was working and choosing artists specifically for projects. Um, in my last role though, I got to manage a team of in-house designers who were awesome. And it was actually a really interesting experience having gone through both of those to sort of see the differences between working with a team that you get to help shape and grow and develop versus bringing on a fresh person per project who you're trying to sort of you bring them on for who they are in their work and their style, but you're also needing to mold them into what that particular project or company needs. Um, mm. So it's, it's definitely been a really different experience with both, both super great and valuable, but um, just totally different there. Interesting. So yeah, I think that speaks to a point of as independent artists, you know, thinking about it, how we can help help art directors, you know, basically be, be helpful to art directors by, you know, trying to be flexible. And as much as we bring our own style and our own creative ideas, it's like remembering the, that the art director still needs to get their product and it needs to fit into their line. 
um, and how to, how we can sort of facilitate that in a way. Yeah, and I think that's, um, and I know you and I have talked separately about this before, but that's one of the biggest things I think, at least that I experienced, and it's going to be different wherever you go, because I think the title of art director is kind of can sum up so many different mm. things. You know, at some companies, it means you're really hands on and in the work and other companies, it's a title that sometimes you get really early on in your career. And it's much more about just passing art through hands, you know, and it's, it can, it can vary quite a bit, but anytime I've worked with an independent artist, and now I try to do this when I'm working with art directors, it's like, what can I do to make their life easier? Um, <laughs> It's like, they're dealing with so much on their end as far as you might be a great fit for the project, but they're still having to pitch stuff internally and, um, you know, give feedback on your work based on how it applies to their customer. And so whatever you can do to sort of be flexible and to always meet those deadlines and not have someone have to chase you down to get the artwork from you. Like those are all like really small little things, but I think it's, it's so helpful when you're on the other end to have someone that's that's sort of in control of what they're doing and we'll pop in and say, Hey, I know we talked about getting this art to you on Wednesday and here it is. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, so when you're, when you were working in house, did you get a number of cold emails with artists pitching your work, like just showing up in your inbox and being like, we love your company and you know, this is our artwork. Um, and how did you kind of, did you respond to the, like, I just know as someone who has sent out cold pitch, who has mil who's lots of students who are always sending out cold pitches. I just want to know as an art director, what was your reaction to some of those cold pitches? Was that a helpful thing? Was that a, oh, this is just another thing weighing down my inbox? Like where, where did you stand and kind of how did you deal with the, with the cold pitches? I kind of fell in the middle personally, <laughs> where it's, you know, there were times when cold pitches were great, like whoever had sent that pitch had done their research on the company, were a really good fit. They approached it in a really normal way. Like just be a human, just be like art directors are human. We don't want the robot on the other end or the person that's carelessly just sending out mass emails. Like just be normal, just be cool. Um, you know, and those that's good people. advice. Be normal and be cool, be like normal. forever and always. Be normal <laughs> in life. Um, and those are the people I usually would respond to. And again, when you're working in house, you're usually a year and a half ahead on whatever you're working on. And you're working in, so you're working in whatever season you're currently designing for, but you're also, which is a year and a half ahead. But then you're also in some aspects, three years ahead, because you're also planning out that next line that's coming. So you're always in the stage of directing current projects working on planning for future projects. So it's just this like rolling basis that happens. And a lot of times people would cold pitch, which would be great. And I'm like, awesome art. Um, I have absolutely nothing I can use it for right now because we're already designing for this and we're planning for that. And this doesn't meet any of those needs. So realistically, it might be another, you know, year and a half, two years before there's a fresh new set of things that I can pull this person for. Um, and so I would respond if I felt that person had put in enough effort, I don't, effort's not the right word, but truly was actually interested in the company and had tailored their pitch to us. I would definitely respond and be like, love your work. Um, if they were someone new to the industry or like fresh out of school, I would always try to be like, you know, I love your work, but we, you know, do a lot of children's books and I'd love to see some more figurative work. Um, you know, that's something if you want to reach out in, in six months, a year, whatever, please send that stuff along. I'd love to see it. Or, you know, we need art for greeting cards right now. Do you have any examples of, you know, artwork with lettering on it or whatever it may be? Awesome. Um, the ones I didn't respond to, and apologies to those people, <laughs> <laughs> um, were ones where it just really felt like a mass pitch where they weren't, they were just, you know, every company they could possibly think of, they were just sending their work to, regardless of how it actually fit in with that company's right. vision, brand style. And like, it's okay, I think at least it's personal opinion to pitch something that you might feel that company is like, it's not a hundred percent a perfect fit for, but you need to be able to explain in a very brief way how it can benefit that company if they were to 
go, or, you know, down a path with you that is slightly different for their customer. Like what value are you going to bring to that customer and that company? And, you know, so it's, it's not like you always have to find a perfect match, but I think just being aware enough and doing your market research enough to know where you can help elevate that company and add mm. to them, even if, you know, they're not currently doing something that's a perfect fit for you. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I, I, I hear you and you, what a, like, what a wonderful thing as someone who might've been on the other end of the cold pitch as an artist, a new artist to get that, like, information from you about you know potentially adding more of one thing or you know we're specifically looking for this so keep that in mind is like getting that kind of feedback is always wonderful and I do get in some of my you know my class community of like I just heard back this like what does this mean <laughs> or what can I do what should I say back to this and it's like so I hear some of these what some you know art directors are responding um like current in the current market because I personally am not like cold pitching very much at this moment, but, um, but yeah, you know, it, it's always a win to hear back anything, even if that, that thing is, it's not a fit because at least then, you know, right. The, it's the crickets. It's the not hearing anything that, that truly drives everyone in this industry mad because it's like, come on, man, we just want, you know, when you're independent, you're just trying to make connections and it's really hard to forge those relationships over email um and but sometimes that's the only way you know that's your only opportunity and so you just do what you have to do but it's it can be very frustrating and and so it's wonderful that I understand why you didn't respond to all of them because that is exhausting I don't even under even respond to all of the emails I get especially the ones I do get like now that I have a blog and stuff I get a lot of like pull pitches about like you know SEO and like you know just like we'd love to get you to the top of the search engines and it's like okay but I mean for free, sure. <laughs> sure I'm sure you do right like also no offense but if you looked at my rankings I'm not, I'm doing okay so like I don't know what you're talking about <laughs> so yeah you just ignore those and it's okay um so I hear you but that is awesome that you were able to give some advice um so another question I have is like if you if you didn't always pick I, I swear we'll move to other questions beyond just you being art director but <laughs> this is something that like people are always asking me of like I want to hear from more art directors so I have to get in when I can um so like when you didn't choose someone necessarily from your cold pit, like if you were starting a new project and you knew you needed a look that you didn't have in-house a certain style that you didn't have in-house is there certain places that you specifically researched um, did you have, like, how did you find artists if not in your inbox? Yeah. So, um, I use Pinterest all the time, still do. Um, and I would create boards for different types of projects that we would consistently do over and over again, whether it was a journal line that was getting refreshed every season, or it was, okay, well, you know, every year and a half, there's a new children's book. Like, let me start gathering different artists that I feel like could be a potential to work with um, without knowing necessarily exactly what the project was yet. So I would always have a running board of that. Um, sometimes I would use Instagram by searching hashtags and I know that doesn't work as well now, but um, for example, if I had to do, let's just say um, a puzzle focused on camping or whatever, I might start putting in, you know, camping illustration, things like that to just kind of see who was already like passionate about that kind of art. Um, okay. Cause I think that's a big connection piece, at least for me is it's like, I want an artist to be invested in the project as much as the team in house is invested in that project and like be behind it and believe in it and be excited about it. And so sometimes that was a great way to find artists who were already working in that subject matter or, um, you know, searching hand lettering if you want something that's hand lettered or whatever it was. Um, those were for me, two of the biggest things that I would use. Um, again, Instagram, I know it's challenging now for artists. It's, it really is. And I have no idea, like even with my own stuff, like what actually gets seen and what doesn't. But what I will say is regardless of anyone seeing it or not, keep doing it um, because you don't know, you really don't know. And it's still great practice to put yourself out there and to be able to speak about your work, mm -hmm. talk about the things you're interested in, 
what is it about, um, you know, whatever area it is that you really want to be working in in the creative industry, like that's your chance to showcase that. And sure, you might not be getting thousands and thousands of eyes on it anymore. But when that right set of eyes does land on it, it's like, oh, wow, this is great. This person loves this subject matter. They're into this. You know, it's like, it's already there. Yeah. That frame is there for you. Um, I, yeah, I so. feel like Instagram, you know, I treat, I, I sort of say the same thing. Like I'm I'm never gonna, I mean, who knows what the future will hold, but I, I have thus far not been any sort of viral social media superstar. <laughs> and so, um, but it's like, it's not so much about followers. It's like thinking about it as like basically a second homepage, right? And one yeah. you update more often than you really do your own website. Like certainly we I feel more pressured uh, in somewhat of a good way to post new art on Instagram than I do to like update my website, you know? So your Instagram is your second homepage. So whether or not, yeah, a lot of people are landing on it or not, it, it's okay. And then the other thing I would say is like, I've talked to... Uh, I had an interview oh, a while back for, for someone in my course. And she was saying when new artists approach her, she goes right to their Instagram instead of their website, mm -hmm. because it's like an equalizer, right? They're the feed always is looking the same. The art is, you know, you know exactly what you're getting versus, you know, people's websites are all over the place sometimes <laughs> and aren't always organized in the best way for an art director, which actually is a whole other conversation that I, we could have, we could dive into, but you know, simple, easy to read art isn't always available on a website, whereas it is on Instagram. So I do see the benefit of that. Um, I, yeah, I would say absolutely. Keep it up to date. And I think there's, I mean, you do it, you do you, you do whatever works for you. But I like to me, there's always kind of this split between um, people being like, do I put everything I make on Instagram or do I keep it curated? Like I keep a website curated and it's the best of, you know, what I can do. And I think that's like always kind of a bit of a squishy space there because for me personally, at this point in my career, like I only really, for the most part, want to showcase stuff there. That's like my stronger work, not absolutely everything I ever do because it is for me that like really quick read front facing site in a way. Um, but I also think there's value in putting things out there that are spontaneous and fun and just, you know, practice things that you're working on. And I think, I think that's something that just gets brought up a lot as a conversation thing of like, well, which way do I go? What do I do? And it's like, I think that's, you know, you got to find what works for you. Um, what works for you, you know? and what, what makes you kind of happy, right? Happy. Because like, if yeah. it's stressful, like, look, some people are never going to be happy on Instagram, no matter what, but like, if it's stressful to be this perfectly curated matched thing, and like, I don't have enough work to be posting my best, uh, my best work yeah. only comes once every three months. So I don't know what, to, you know, oh, I feel right versus now. <laughs> like showing off sketches and, and whatever yeah. that can show the behind the scenes of your brand. And that can be a way for art directors to have a personal connection with you as well. So, I mean, yeah, there's definitely benefits of both sides of it. So it's like, which mm -hmm. one do you feel? Do you like the spontaneity of, of, kind of showing your behind the scenes or do you like to like plan out like how how everything's going to look all together and making sure it's like your brand's perfect yeah. identity you know and I think that's just I think that's one of those things where it's hard for people because there is no rule you know people love rules and I'm like this I know is so and to me that's what's fun about it is there is no rules you get to really put forth your art your voice in whatever way you want to you know and I think that's like obviously spring for some of us and really scary for other people but it's like you've got to have fun at the end of the day because if you're not enjoying it there's there's truly no point in doing it you know? not for the money people no. <laughs> you better like, be having fun it's got to bring you joy in some way I mean yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh yeah for sure um so good call on Instagram the one thing that's been coming up and, you know, this whole lately in the news of like meta is like taking all your data for AI. I mean, that's a whole nother conversation. I don't expect you to have a take on that, but because it's like literally just, you know, people are talking about it now, but I know artists are stressing about that and, and AI in general. Um, and, and so it's like, oh, you know, not wanting to post as much or not wanting to put your work online as much, but 
I don't really see what other opportunity, you know, what other yeah. options you have at this point, at this junction. I don't think we have a lot of, you know, and it's hard. I stress out about it too. Like, I don't want to make it sound like trivial and like, don't worry about it. Cause for me where I've kind of landed and this is the same thing, like art gets stolen constantly, whether it's going to be through AI, whether it's people pulling stuff off your Instagram, your website, whatever it's like, unfortunately, it it's really unfortunate and there's not a lot we can do about it except for, you know, we can keep nagging and talking about it and hoping eventually there's better laws around protecting us and all that kind of stuff. So I, I wouldn't say get complacent about it. <laughs> right, sure. right, right. Of course. But at the same time, it's like, you can't let it hold you back because it will, by not putting your art out there, it is going to hold you back because there's no other way for people to experience it right, right. now. And if no one knows you're doing it. They can't hire wonderful you platform in the future where we can all share our work and you know whatever 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 it's just it doesn't exist right now and I think that's it is hard um yeah and I've just kind of come to terms with it it was like I can either get frustrated and this is more to do with stealing art than AI because that's mm -hmm. so so new that I haven't like seen something where I've been like I'm pretty sure that's AI trying to rip me off or I haven't yeah, like, yeah. lost a project because of that um but it just was like I can either put this out here and hope it someone falls in love with it or it makes someone's day brighter or I can keep it to myself and you know no one will steal it but I can't be upset every time it gets stolen because it's just we don't have the energy it. I don't I, have the energy to chase it down either anymore <laughs> I came to a realization about AI people have been asking me about AI for the last like year basically of like my opinion and is it worth start you know and I've kind of been like not engaging in that conversation too much because you know what do I know but I had a realization yesterday that I was like, this is my current stance on AI. <laughs> Here we go. Are you ready? Breaking news. Ready. Everyone's been waiting for it. Reporters are standing by. <laughs> um, no, but I was thinking about how, and Jill, I would say you remember this, uh, not to guess your age, but just knowing that you've been in this industry for a while. You remember when in the early, mid 2000s and yeah, mid 2000s, Illustrator was still relatively new. I mean, it had been around for a while, but like super flat, super vectory, geometric y art was the style. And I was remembering this because I have a couple print and pattern books. I'm like looking over at my bookcase, <laughs> a couple print and pattern books from the website Print and Pattern, which is so wonderful. And I was looking through it for something. And they were published in like 2009 or something like that. And so all the art is super illustratory, like flat illustratory. And now, even though people still use Adobe Illustrator all the time, the, that style has come and gone, right? Like it's that super, super flat. There are some artists who are still really making it work, but it it's we're everyone's looking for a more hand-drawn look now and so if you're using illustrator you better have a lot of texture etc cetera, etc cetera. so i was thinking about how very specific the ai style is like no matter what it's got that fantastic phantasma the like glow glow. about it that like light you know so it's like yes art might look like that for a while and it might be because it's all being made by ai but after a while people are going to get tired of that and there's going to have a reaction and it's going to come back so we might be in for you know a deluge of ai art for a while but eventually we're going to move on that's my little I, AI. i totally agree and i feel that way about i call it the procreate style too mm. You know, and I think that's, again, starting to shift now that brushes are getting more advanced and stuff. But for a while, everything that was done, like you could spot it so quickly. And it's not that the art was bad or anything. It just became this very specific look. And it was like, okay, that's a thing. But I do, I do feel what you're saying. And I think that obviously we have no idea what's really going to happen. And I think it's going to be a bit of a roller coaster. But I think that's also our opportunity to keep talking about it to keep pushing where we can for laws to be better and to protect us as creatives, but also to like put our human side out there. And I was talking ab about this the other day on Instagram and someone asked, well, what do you mean by that? Like, what if you're not comfortable showing your face or showing, you know, you don't have a studio space, you feel comfortable showing whatever it is. And I was like, I don't, I don't mean that way. Like 
of course I know you're a human without seeing your face, <laughs> you know, but I just mean like with the words that you're choosing, with the way you're talking about your art, um, just be a human, talk about the thought process that goes into why mm. you're making what you're making, mm. you know, because that's something AI can't do. And that's something that that emotional piece is something as humans that we can put into our art and that a computer right now can't replicate. And it's like, and we're always able to pivot and change and AI at the moment, at least is slightly behind us because it can only pivot and change to what we're currently doing. So it's like, right. we can, you know, for now it's like, you can keep innovating and you can stay ahead of it in that sense. But I also think it, it's just a good opportunity to, to be at that human level again, and instead of it just being shiny art, shiny art, this is why I make this beautiful, shiny art. This mm. is what this art can bring into your life. You know, like it gives you that chance to like really be passionate about what you're doing and talk about it, speak about it, let people know, um, because that's something you're not going to get from AI art, you know? Yeah, I love that. I, I, yeah, you know what? I, I recently interviewed Janetta Gonzalez and she was talking basically about like the idea of the human, uh, like a personal brand and, you know, just mm. basically bringing, similar to what you're saying is like bringing in, you know, your personal uh, experiences into into the story of your art and your brand, and so I really I really love that. Now I will say, as an art director who has received cold emails, I'm sure you don't want the whole story in one email. Don't be telling me I'm not even an art director, and I'm like, you don't need to tell me all about how this collection came from your love of ducks, who then your you know blah 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 blah. I mean, in in some cases it's great, and in some like you know, on Instagram or maybe in telling a story or something like that. But when you're sending pitch emails, keep it brief, people. That's my, that's yeah. a hot tip. <laughs> I was for a while was doing portfolio reviews. And one of the things that would happen is either in the portfolio that folks were sending out or on their website about page, they would have a book about themselves. And I was like, okay, there's a lot of good content here as to who you are and why you do what you do but you've got two seconds to grab. No one's going to read it. No Thank one, you. Thank no you. one's going to read it. <laughs> it's true. But it's true. before you feel like it's all wasted work, you know, pull pieces out of that that you can use for a social media post, you know, pull little bits out to spread, sprinkle across your website. Like it doesn't all need to be in this one massive chunk. I agree. Like you can be infused in your work and in your website and in your brand as much as you want. And you can, you know, use those little tidbits throughout. It doesn't need to be this giant block of text here. I, I'm Jill. Here I am. Here's everything you need to know about me. Um, and I think that was just one of the things where I was like, no, I hate to say nobody cares because you do care. You know, you want to be invested. No, no. I, I pretty much say nobody <laughs> <laughs> I'll say that, but no, it's, it's true. Like, no, it's true. And that's, that's advice that I'm always giving to, you know, I just did a, I just finished doing a like pitch email clinic for some of my students. And basically, you know, it's like, keep it brief. And this woman had a really wonderful, email because she has some great experience and she was really highlighting it. And it wasn't really even that long, but I still was like, yeah, we still have to take out some of this. And this is great information. And you're really showing that even though maybe you don't haven't had a lot of jobs in this particular industry, you really have the background and you you actually are really positioning yourself quite well, but we still have to make it a little bit snappier because yeah. gotta keep it moving, people. <laughs> I think that's a huge when it comes to Asara's like portfolio tangent, but um I think it's like one of the biggest things. And it I went through this when I left you know, 15 years of in-house work. I had a shit ton of products I had designed. I had art directed. Some of them won awards, like really great stuff on my website. And I let it all go. I took all of it off um, when I decided to go freelance because I had a very specific vision for where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do. And I think that's one of the hardest things when looking through people's portfolios is getting them to let go of stuff. It's like, mm -hmm you don't have to prove to everyone every single talent that you have. What is it you want to do for this company, this brand, this person, whatever, you only need to share that with them. You know, like it's, it's great that you also have this background as a dentist or whatever it is, you know, like that's amazing. And I'm glad, and it shows you're a professional and all those things, but like, it doesn't really serve this right here, right now. And so being able to kind of start to go through your own work or your own experience and pull the stuff that 
isn't necessarily related to where you're trying to go and you can remove it and it's hard it sucks you know and I you was, don't have to put it in the trash that's the thing yeah, it's, you, just it's not, it you can hold it and then someday when someone comes to you and says I love your work but do you have anything like this you're like actually I totally actually, do and I here's do that you know here's yeah. what I can do for you yep like yeah. I you know it's like I designed for a long time I don't have anything on my website that talks you know I don't have any logo work I've done I don't have any books I've designed. I don't have that stuff on my website anymore because I'm not currently looking to get that kind of work. And so, right. yeah, it sucks to pull it off because I'm proud of some of it. And it's like, but look, I can do this too. But it's like, okay, if I don't really want to be doing that, it's okay to take it off. You know, it's, it's fine. <laughs> it is, no, that's great. I mean, that's great advice. You're, that's the thing. You're supposed to be showing off the work that you want to get more of. So yeah. definitely, yeah. Showing off like your award win winning logo when you want to be an illustrator is, is kind of irrelevant. Yeah. I, I think for newer designers, one thing is just, you know, I think there's just this feeling of not being enough. Mm -hmm. So any, if they have like, you know, I don't have any clients in the surface design world so you know at least I do at least I have made an award-winning logo so at least you know I have some art chops or some design yeah. chops you know even if it's not the same thing I think there or and I would say also the other part of it probably is you're almost you're probably more likely to find a logo client than a surface design client right off the bat which yeah. segues perfectly into my next question, which is, thank you for going on that long tangent with me, but uh, you, so you left your corporate design jobs um, and this was over a year ago and you decided to take the plunge into being an independent artist. How did you know you were ready for that jump? How did you prepare for that uh, transition? You know, what, what made you ready to take on the world of being an independent designer? Ooh, well, <laughs> it was like, culmination of a bunch of stuff but what ha generally happens if you work in-house is at some point in order to move up the ladder get the bigger paycheck more and more design work comes off your plate and you're Ooh. spending more and more time working on line plans um, I was in excel constantly and I was pulling together presentations constantly and doing market research all the time which I love that is something I truly love um but it was becoming 80% of my job with, you know, some art sprinkled in. And I just got to a point where I wasn't, I loved my job. I loved my coworkers. And I was just like, this isn't, this isn't making me happier. And change is really scary. And I'm not someone who's great with it. But I started to realize like the fear of the unknown was going to make me happier than the path I was on. And I was just like, this is something I have to do. Like, I kind of always knew it was something I wanted to try at some point in my life, but it was just like, this is the time. Um, on top of that, I live on an Island. So commuting is an issue. Yeah. <laughs> you know? it's, it's, it's a real thing. Um, you know, and I think when you work in product, it's really hard to work remote because you need to be hands on constantly looking at stuff, touching things, you know, evaluating how something's opening, closing, is that magnet strong enough? Like mm. all those little things that just make it hard to, to work fully remote doing that kind of job and leading a team of creatives that are doing that kind of type of work. Um, so I kind of knew that was something I eventually was going to want to do. So when I started to kind of feel it in me, like I was like, oh shit, like the, the scariness is actually feeling better right now than what I'm currently doing. I sat down, I looked at our finances as far as like, so we're two, you know, two income households and we have no kids. So I realized that is like, obviously a completely unique situation, depending on where you are, what you're going to need to do to, to jump full time into freelance. Um, but when you don't have children you're responsible for, it's a lot less scary. Yeah, it is a lot. I would imagine. Yep, yep. And if you have a partner, obviously that makes it much but... easier. Um, and so I looked and I saved up enough to get me through a year if I had no work for like what my half of the bills would be. Mm -hmm. um, because I didn't want to have to, I didn't want to go, I like, I knew I wasn't going to have a ton of work in the first year. Like, I've always freelanced on the side with whatever job I've had. And I just, it's not consistent, you know, and it's, and so I needed that security. And I also knew that I didn't want to give up 
our lifestyle completely either. Like that was right. important to not have to be like, okay, well now I'm freelance and we can never eat out again. And we can right. you know, go on vacation again, whatever it was. Um, so yeah, that for me took the stress. There was stress from other things, but the financial stress, at least out of that first year, because I was like, even if I make zero money, I can pay every oh, bill yeah. I need to pay. And my life isn't going to drastically shift. So that for me was like the biggest thing. Um, and then while I was still employed and had that consistent income, I tried to get anything out of the way that was expensive because I could still kind of budget for those things. So it was mm. like, okay, I need a new computer. Um, let me get my website, like upgrade the platform that it's on so that I can do all these other things I want to do and make it a little better. Like I tried to get all that stuff out of the way as much as I could. Um, which is hard because it's like, you're working two jobs at that point. You know? Yeah, for sure. You're trying to get yourself set up for success, but you're also really trying as hard as you can to keep your current job, you know, doing the best you can do at it. Like you don't want to start sucking at that just so you can leave, you know, <laughs> it was like, no, I want to leave on the best foot possible and have you guys set up for success. And then I can exit gracefully and go do my own thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, yeah. that was very, that was smart. So, so it sounds like you might have, because you had been doing some freelance work already, um, you maybe had some connections already. So, like, what were some of the first steps you took to find that paying work once you left? I mean, like I said, you already had some, but, but what was kind of like, how did you like jump into like finding new, finding new work for this new freelance life? It's been, it's been wild. Um, <laughs> Uh, that was the oh, one I thing, oddly <laughs> enough, I didn't have a plan for. Um, I think I was a little naive and thinking that people needed more of work than they actually need. Um, and that was a mistake on my part, but. <laughs> well, only- and to say you, so you left, when was it? Like basically the beginning of 2023, is that true? Or when was, when did you start? Yeah, it was, event? I think I basically, like everyone was leaving for so it would have been 2022. Actually, my yeah, it was right before Christmas. So yeah, right before basically, 2020. Basically, you were starting. Um, um, so it was a tough year from most of. I mean, from my own experience and from most people's. Like it seems like we're in a bit of a lull right now. Let's just say yeah. for design stuff. So, um, so it's a tough year to get started because yeah, it does feel like, I mean, you know, even as someone who's been doing this for a long time, it's like, it's been a lot slower for me for design work. So, um, it's so anyway, crazy. sorry, but so you were, you started looking and, and I started looking, I start, I did start cold pitching places cause I had had, you know, places that I had researched and was like, okay, I'd love to send my work to these places. Um, and I had, the only thing I really had lined up was I just had my first kind of collection come out with Figo um, and, and the fabric doesn't pay much. So that was really more just about, I was, I love to sew. So I was excited to do it. Um, but yeah, I just got lucky. I wouldn't say I got lucky. I think the, <laughs> so I was like, I got to stop saying that the two biggest projects that I had um, that first year freelancing have turned into repeat clients. And that has saved me quite a bit. Um, the first being Sir Latab, and I actually got that gig by, so the tiny little island I live on is about 20 minutes from Seattle. And so it's really idyllic and sweet. And a lot of people come over for the weekends or whatever. And um, during the holiday, I said yes to doing a holiday market on this island. I literally had no product to sell. Like I had nothing. <laughs> And I was like, sure, I'll do it just because I love the woman who was hosting it. And I was like, oh, this will be cool. And it was really tiny. And um, the one of the art directors just happened to be walking through the market, saw my work, and she was really sweet, introduced herself. And she's like, would you ever want to work with us? And I was like, oh, sure, you know, and kind of figured nothing would come out of it. And then a few months later, she emailed me and she was like, hey, I want to pitch your work. And this is another great, I guess, thing for folks to understand is a lot of times art directors, even if they love you, they still have to pitch your work to an internal team. So the work, she was pitching my work for Easter 24, um, 24, yeah, plus past Easter we just had, um, <laughs> and, you know, uh, and pitching other artists as well. You know, it's great. They chose my work and, you know, I had to, I had to do some stuff to make it fit in more with their customer and all of that. 
And then I did, and that project went really well. And then I did three more projects with them after that. So I think it's like one of those things where it was, it was lucky in that sense of not everyone lives close to a major city where there's people that work at these big companies that might happen to come by. But at the same time, if I hadn't put myself out there and agreed to do something that I was completely unprepared for, mm. I might not have ever made that connection. So yeah. it's like one of those things of just like, if, just get yourself if out all, there. Yeah. Get yourself out there. There's no one right way to do it. Um, you never know. <laughs> It's just really different. And I also wanted to make the point, like when you were saying about repeat customers, I think that's one of the really wonderful things about our industry versus something like, I mean, like definitely like logo design. If you think about logo design, you don't need a new logo every year. But if you work with someone and you design for something for one season, then the next season, the season after that, they're going to, you know, if things work, to work out and the price is right and all that kind of stuff, you're hopefully going to have a repeat client. So as much as it can be really hard to find those initial clients, have once you do have them, and, you know, we talked already earlier about how to make things easier for those art directors once you're working with them of being flexible and making sure to hit your deadlines and, and doing all those things. If you're easy to work with and your art, you know, is, is on point, then you can, then you have that client. you mostly have that, yeah. client. you know, I, most of my clients are, are repeat client, you know, I have my ongoing clients that I continue to work with. So, um, so that's the benefit of this industry, I'd say, because there are definitely s certain industries where, you know, you're always like, you know, if you're gonna be a wedding photographer, you're only doing that once for that one client. Yeah. And yes, they might have friends <laughs> and stuff and there's word of mouth, but like, you're not going to be a wedding photographer for, you know, that person's wedding every year. So, um, so we do have that benefit. We do. And I think there's also the benefit of connecting with, I mean, there's some art directors that, are just more, just through the type of work they do are more hands-on and more, you build more of a relationship with them and you never know where they're going to go next or who they're going to pass your name off to. Um, you know, I always tell people <laughs> if you're working with someone and you're creating something custom for them, just always do what they ask. If you've got another idea that you think is great or stronger than what they've asked you to do, you can all, you know, feel free to present that too, but like, just please always do what someone asks of you because you don't really know the whole backstory to why they're asking you to do that. And like the decisions they need to make might not be based on how do we make your art the best, but it's like, how do we make your art the best for our customer? And so like doing what they ask first, and it's great to have other ideas and present those as well, but just cover that basis first. That makes, yeah, that's so key. And I think, you know, I, I tell the story of, you know, when I worked in house, I'm always trying to convey to people that it's not always about, it's not personal about your art, it's just business decisions. And often the people making the decisions on whether the art stays or goes from the line, like whether they pick up the art or they don't, it's not necessarily even creative people. Oh, it's no. people yeah. who are buyers and often not creative people, right? And, you know, having seeing you know really beautiful art be rejected for art that's maybe personally I'm not in, as in love with because one was more green and one was more blue and they already had a more blue and they need a more green so when they ask for a yellow background and you're like yellow but it's gonna look way better in pink it's like give them the yellow background because yep. they need yellow in their line they already got red they already got green they need the other color so yeah so yeah it's like things like that you just don't know what, just as you say you don't know the backstory um so one thing that we kind of discussed earlier previously when we were talking off camera um, is, you know, the, I'd say the good thing about being an independent designer, I think people have a lot of nervousness about, you know, if they haven't gone to art school, if they don't have an art background, both of us have art backgrounds. We went to art school. We have kind of the pedigree and we are lucky for that. Um, but no one, when I'm like pitching myself for freelance, no one's like, you know, what, what did you, what's your BFA? Like, do you have a BFA? You know, no one's really asking me that question. So I do think it's more about your art than your like technical resume. Um, however, as a professional, what are some things that you see that artists maybe need to be sure to develop as they build their skill sets, maybe that they might've missed 
<laughs> you know, because they didn't have that art school background, because they're, you know, learning, especially, you know, with the new focus on pattern design, specifically repeating patterns. And it's like, there's a lot of focus on let's make sure that, you know, it repeats from end to end, which is obviously important in a pattern. But what are some of the things that, you know, more holistically an artist needs to look at or a new designer needs to look at to build a skill set that's going to stand out to art directors and companies. Yeah. Um, and I think what's so important to talk about this is that, like you said earlier, styles change drastically. So I know there's this focus on style, um, which is great, like whatever, but if you don't have those fundamental skills, you can't tweak your style or change it as times change and it's going to be harder and harder for you to find work as time goes on if you're not if you don't have those fundamental skills to be able to pivot um so like for me what I see and especially this comes up with pattern design a lot is because folks are so focused on the repeat which there's plenty of industries where you can design awesome product and you don't even need to know how to do a repeat right. so it's like focusing on composition, like what makes a composition interesting? What makes it feel balanced? Um, use of color and like how color can lead your eye through a composition and make it see it in the way that you want it to be seen or interpreted. Um, especially when it comes to color to being able to understand the difference between like the color science and then like what makes a commercial color palette successful and then being able to work within that palette because, and I had done a video on this a while ago, like you can take a palette and it can look beautiful in just a bunch of little swatches, but if you can't understand or figure out how it's like putting a puzzle together, like which colors to use the most, which to just use in tiny little bits to sprinkle in there, you know, like you need to find that balance and understand that. And that's a huge part of what makes art sell. And I think that's something that's lacking because I see a lot of folks rely on, especially if they're just starting out on the, um, I'm blanking on the name of it, an illustrator, the color. Oh yeah. The recolor tool, but just like, hey, thank you. It, like recolor auto color, it will do like an auto yeah. color. I know what you're talking about. I never yeah. use it. So I don't know the name either. But... I don't use it either. And it's like, and it, and it's great. Those tools are great. It's a fun way, especially if you're stuck to quickly be able to say like, well, what would it look like if I threw hot pink into the mix, you know, but, um, I think you really have to start learning to train your eye to be able to see not just like, you know, you do that one piece and you're like surprised by it and you're like, oh, this is really good. Like to be able to go in and analyze, like, why is it really good? Mm. Like you need to be able to train your eye to start to do that because that's the only way that you really start to get better. Um, I try to be pretty open and share like, um, okay, this is a piece I did that's not very commercial. And here's how I would tweak it to be more commercial. And, you know, people always love to pop in and be like, oh, but I love the first one. Why are you... And I'm like, I'm not down on it. It's not, it's just the reality of the world we live in. And I, you know, at this point in my career, I can pick my own art apart and be like, this is good. This was trash over here. And that's mm -hmm. why I'm allowed to make trash sometimes. Um, but you need to be able to get in there and understand why one piece is better than another piece, you know, yeah. within your own body of work. And I think that just takes a little bit of time and practice and training and that's something that I think is hard when you're starting out because you're so, there's this like need to create more and more and more without stopping to be mm -hmm. like, why, I, if I'm just on the go, go, go mode, I'm not stopping to pause and be like, okay, was this successful? Is there, maybe it wasn't, but there's one little successful thing in it. And like, how do I then take that and use it over here? Like you need to kind of be like your own I don't know, scientists on your own work basically and be like, why is this working? Why is that working? How can I piece it together again in the future? Like there's just, I don't know, there's a lot of nuanced things that seem small, but I think once you start to train your eye to see them, it really elevates your work quite a bit and they're not necessarily super challenging things to do. It's just sort of training your brain to, to see them. Yeah, I think you're right. And I mean, I wish I don't have any like, classes to direct people to to like give them that training i do have two youtube videos uh that are about one's called like basically i think it's called five amateur mistakes 
that you might be making and how to fix them. And then five more amateur mistakes or something like that. So you can look that up on my YouTube channel, anyone who's watching. And those give some of those, some of those really basic things that I see new designers doing all the time that it's like quick tweak to know that this isn't quite, you know, going to work. But yeah, building up the understanding of balance and and what colors really work and what colors are just garish <laughs> yeah. those bright colors I mean I love a bright color but it's you have to have this balance and and what's like vibrating the eye versus what's like a nice a you nice know, punch nice... to the eye but isn't making you go Ooh. yeah exactly like... so it does take experience um and 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 I like what you're saying about kind of analyzing what what's working in in some of your favorite pieces and what what maybe in other artists pieces and what's actually on the market um and and things like that and taking a look at dissecting what's it it's easier for it's something that we do naturally because we've been doing this for so long and it, i understand that it is harder for new designers um to kind of like have that awareness i remember when i first started my my very first job out of school it was a bedding company and I had this boss who, I mean, even now looking back, I'm pretty sure like he was a little over the top on, on color and stuff, but like, it would be like, can you take out one drop of red from that taupe color? You know what I mean? Like, he'd be like wanting me to go down one on the hue thing. And, and I'm like, you know, of course I'm like 22 and like, are we for real here? But okay, sure, sure, sure. You know? Um, but I remember, you know, thinking like, I will never have that sense of like this needs one drop more red but now I mean maybe not one drop but like yeah now I do have a very you know curated like mm, this is just a little too when I pick paint colors for my house I'm like I need a little more green in this just to touch more of this so it does come with practice so for those people who might be watching who I feel like oh how am I gonna get there um you'll get there <laughs> just you, you will know. get there and like <laughs> it's funny the last job I had I feel like so bad I'm like oh no I was not our director that was like <laughs> which I was part of my job you know I'm trying to get like that's what yeah exactly designers and it's like take their amazing work and how do you just up level it a little bit more and like that's that's what I've been paid to do so it's fine but it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> we also you know it's like part of it is knowing the the manufacturing process that's happening. And I know if you're going to print on the uncoated paper, it's going to suck up some of the ink and it's going to look duller. So like, let's brighten that up or we're putting a lamb on top and that's going to make everything more yellow. So let's cool our colors down a little bit. So like some of that comes with knowing that end of it as well. Um, but yeah, just, I think what can really help too, if you're starting out is like walk stores that do good merchandising, you know? So like anthropology is a store. I know we all love it. Um, but they do a great job of merchandising in there and just see, especially around holidays, whether it's like Mother's Day, Christmas, whatever, what kinds of colors they're bringing into their store. Like, because those are, those are the colors your artwork is going to have to sit next to, right? So if you're designing something for Mother's Day, it's like, look at those Mother's Day end caps and displays and like, how are they being merchandised? And is your art going to fit in that? Is it going to stand out? Are your colors so far off that it's like, gonna be icky in there or is it like oh this this can fit in really nice and it's just a little bit different so it will stand out like you know just start yeah you can even take as much as you can take a digital picture and like put your thing Walk right your next to right, it, right? like you can do that I I think that's a good suggestion too for like when you're researching companies and trying yes. to know if your artwork fits it's like you can go on the website and you know pick five designs that they have they currently have in their line and then put yours in there and like shuffle the deck like does it yeah. does yours stand out like a sore thumb or is it like yeah that one works with all the other ones you know it's, yeah that's, it's, I always tell people to do that when they're like I really want to you know work for x company or whatever I'm like well then have you know, have pictures of their store everywhere, like the way they're merchandising it, what's on their website, what's on their bestsellers list. And, you know, keep all that in your mind and make sure your art's in alignment with it, but also still stands out a little bit. Cause it's like, there's something to be said for more of the same, cause they are always going to need that to make their customer base happy. But most people are also looking for what can make our customer base happy, but also push them a little, you know? Right. I always um, say they're looking for like 10% fresher. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they, 
That's all. Don't try to do 25% fresher. That's too wild. Too wild. <laughs> too crazy. <laughs> They'll never go for it in South Dakota. Um, <laughs> uh, I have like 400 more questions for you, but we're already basically at an hour. So I'm going to end with a one that will, in theory, be sort of quick, but it's the question that everyone is always asking me, and I'm always repeating the answer to. Um, you have been doing freelance work and licensing work. For your freelance work, do you use Adobe Illustrator exclusively? Do you not use what what's what what programs are you using? I use all the programs. <laughs> no, I do so I do use Illustrator. Um I'm primarily Photoshop Procreate back up a little bit. I do a lot of work traditionally and then I'm editing it in Photoshop or Procreate. But right. I also do create some of my art digitally as well. It just depends on the project. Um, I use Illustrator as well, but I tend to use it more for personal branding stuff. Like if I'm, you know, working on like a postcard with my own stuff on it or designing a logo for someone, if I'm doing that on the sly, like I'll do that in Illustrator. And then I also do use it um, quite a bit for making dye lines. So right. even if it's for my own product or if it's, you know, a dye line that a company has sent me that I'm in charge of doing the production work on, which normally I don't do, but it does happen sometimes because I don't have an in-house production designer. Um, yeah. So I definitely use Illustrator for that, especially if I'm doing anything with like type on it, I'm going to do it in there. Um, I don't do book layout anymore, but I used to use InDesign all the time. Um, yeah. So I'm in everything pretty much. The thing is, people think to freelance, you need to know Illustrator. There's no way to freelance if you don't know Illustrator. And that's just not true. I personally, uh, like, I'm, I'm, I love Illustrator and I use it as much as I can um, for projects, but sometimes it doesn't fit the project. And so sometimes I don't use it. And sometimes I use Photoshop or Procreate or, or whatever. Um, and so just to show that you actually kind of rarely use illustrator and only for certain very certain things but you still you know have a freelance career and you license your work is just that was just something I wanted to drive home because people think that it's all about illustrator which it's not the one thing I'll say and this is not related to that at all <laughs> that's okay total tangent but I wanted to make sure I said it because it's something I've to me, that's always been um, something I look for when I'm either looking for artists or now even when I'm just, it's artists that I maybe want to follow on Instagram or whatever. It's like consistency in their work. Because this comes up a lot when people will be like, signature style, signature style. And I'm like, I don't know when the word signature got added. It used to just be style. And I feel mm. like we have to like sexy it up or something lately. I don't know. <laughs> that's good because I did have a question on that that we didn't really even get to so yeah I know well that's why I was like made me think of it and I was like ah I, this is kind of important but so people constantly ask like do you need a signature style and I'm like no you know you know <laughs> but the key I think is consistency so whether you have you know 20 styles that you can do well or you have one be consistent with that on your website and whoever you're pitching to make sure you have enough of that style like if you design in five different styles, show me enough of each of those styles on your website, on your Instagram, whatever, so that I, as someone looking to hire you, feel confident that you can pull it off. And it wasn't mm. just some weird one-off fluke. Um, right. Because that is for me, one of the biggest things is it's like, you know, you're looking through Pinterest and you're like, oh, this is awesome. Pin it. And then you go to that artist's website and you don't really see anything else that looks like it. And I'm like, maybe they're capable of doing it again. Are they capable of doing it on a larger scale when it comes to a collection though? And they need to build out multiple products or is this something that was a one-off and they really can't tease more out of it? You know, like it's just, you don't know. And you took like a community oil painting class and you yeah. made the best landscape of your life, but that's not really your thing. And like, <laughs> exactly. But you just... put it up because it's the best landscape of your life. Yep. Now suddenly, you know, it's like, I you want got that me landscape. over there being like, gambling on do I hire this person and maybe I'm going to have to actually jump in and fix a lot of this artwork which is not my favorite thing to do or do I feel confident that they can pull the project off um and that's a huge one for me personally is just that consistency and I think if you do work in one style primarily like show your best work and especially if it's something where you want to apply to do like um I don't know just say like lots of different gift products, journals, tableware, whatever. 
and all you have is patterns, like you are asking someone to make a pretty big leap mm. to know that you can know. design it's not a just really patterns. good dinner plate that has, you know, this crazy, cool, interesting, you know, composition happening, or, you know, it's just, you're limiting yourself. I think I, it, mm -hmm. you need to show some of those skills because it just pattern really, really limits where your artwork can go. Like this wallpaper behind me, it's like, sure. You can be like, okay, she can draw a Fox. She got some blobby flowers in there, whatever. But it's like, does it give you the confidence that that's all you see to know that I can do an editorial illustration for something, or I know how to draw a human or like all these other things right. that you might need a person to be able to do. And it can be really limiting to just see just flowers. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm going to need a house and some flowers and maybe a chicken. I only know you can do the flower. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> so that's yeah. all incredible advice. I love that. Sorry, um, I was like, gotta get it. No, 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 no. That was important. That was important. You have to be able to show that you can, you can produce uh, what whatever you're showing off that you that yeah. you've done. And like with programs, like I think, I and you and I had talked about this like offline separately. Like, yeah, it can be really overwhelming when you're starting out and you're like. I need to learn a what, excuse me, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, which for me, I didn't learn any of the programs in school either. It was like a learn on the fly at my job, which is stressful, but mm -hmm. learn pretty fast. Um, mm -hmm. It's to me, the more, you know, the more you can make smart choices about what program really makes sense for the art you're trying to make. Um, like when I would do portfolio reviews and people did beautiful, like hand painted work, and then they were trying to make patterns and illustrator and it like, wasn't auto tracing. Art. And it's like, yeah. You know, like this is where it's great to learn another tool because it's going to help you produce artwork. That's more in line with what comes naturally to you. And it's going to be more successful with the type of art you make. Um, and so it's like the more you can familiarize yourself with just the more, I don't know, just the easier your life becomes. I think, you know, it's like being able to switch between programs whenever I need to just helps me to be like, Hey, this is a smarter way to do this. Or I really want to make this type of product and I'm going to need to create my own die line for it. Yeah. I can hop an illustrator, no problem and do that, you know, but it's like, you don't have to know that all at once all the programs at once. That's the thing. I think, I, I feel like that's could be the theme of this conversation. It's like, you're, I, I so appreciate talking to you as someone who has had a similar amount of experience as I had, um, maybe, well, more in-house experience for sure. Um, and because I only did about a decade before I, so now I've been freelance for like 12 years, but just having been in the industry for a long time, it's like, it's, it's easy for us to say, take your time. There's all this, you know, you have to learn this. But of course, I get why when you're starting out, it's like, it feels like so much to do and so much to learn. And also like, P.S., do I want to spend five years like getting better at composition? I need to also like earn some money before. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm not going to learn composition if I'm never going to earn money. Like, but it's like, but you kind of need one to do better you at the other. <laughs> And I do like, I'm a big believer in like, I don't know, your work is always ready for something. It might not be for your dream job though. You know, it's like, you have to have real, like realistic expectations of where you're at and how to get to where you want to be. But like knowing it's okay to be at the beginning and to take some of those jobs that maybe don't sound that sexy up front because you are going to learn from them. And I think yes. like- like if I look back at my first couple of years of jobs, like they were awful jobs, like awful. <laughs> I learned so much. And it's like, you know, I thought coming out of school, I knew everything. I just paid all this money that I'm going to be paying off for the rest of my life, you know, to learn all this stuff. I'm so ready. And it's like, I look back at what I did and it's just like, oh my God, this is bad. <laughs> I mean, and it's okay that I was bad. I was 22 or however old I was, you know? And it's like, it's okay to start to like see all these people online that are doing all these things that look glamorous and to be starting somewhere that isn't because one, it isn't glamorous ever. I can tell you that much. Um, <laughs> I feel pretty confident stating that, but yeah, it's not glamorous. It's just, you know, you've got to start somewhere and you've got to, you know, do it. And sometimes it doesn't pay well in the beginning. Some of them pay well, you know, 20 years down the line, but like there are those times when it's like, you've just got to get in there and take the opportunity and try to learn from it and, and go, you know, I love that.
Yeah. I love that. Well, I'm going to put your links in the description so you can follow Jill on Instagram and check out her work on her website. Thank you so much, Jill. This has been awesome. Like I said, I could talk to you for another like 45 minutes, but uh, we left the people with a lot of information. So, um, so I think we did, did what we could do. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Ready to level up your surface pattern design game? Dive into the ultimate resource hub for aspiring designers, the Surface Pattern Boss Toolkit. Unlock a treasure trove of freebies, including sales sheet templates, exclusive industry expert videos, and mini courses to grow your creative business. Don't miss out. Click the link in the description below to access your toolkit now and become a pattern design pro.